there's always time for Christmas. I don't know the guy who was Santa Claus before me or the guy who came after. All I know is that on December 24th, 2015, it was my turn. I was in an airport bar at the time, stranded between flights due to a sudden blizzard. Everybody around me looked as miserable as I felt. None of us were going to make it to our family's own time for Christmas. I sat there with a flat root beer, texting with my girlfriend Faye and batting away the occasional offer of something stronger from the bartender. Dinner wasn't that good anyway, Faye said. You didn't miss much. It'll make it up to you guys, I reply. Faye and I had just visited my mother in Boston, but my mom came down with the flu during our trip. I stayed behind an extra few days to take care of her. Faye flew out to her parents' house in Colorado, and I expected to meet her there before Christmas dinner fucking weta. Somebody grumbled behind me. Goddamn snowstorms getting heavier. You kidding me? I glanced over and saw a chubby guy in a Celtics jersey staring incredulously at the bar TV. A clatter of glass landing on the counter in front of me made me jump. Found some private reserve in the back, a man said. When I looked down, I saw a bottle of Abita root beer frothing and fizzing all over itself. Some of the foam ran down over a set of withered fingers. My eyes followed them to a gnarled hand, then up a twiggish arm and into the face of a young man. On the house, he continued, other guys on break, I won't say anything if you don't. Who thinks, dude, I said, Taking the bottle and knocking back a few slugs, I tried to hide my disgust for the man's hand. He stared at me, smiling and blinking, until I set the bottle back onto the table. Merry Christmas, he said, and turned away. Mariah tried to speak, but the words died at my lips. The bar went vertical, and my head slammed into the counter. I could hear myself snoring even before the darkness took me. I woke up to my feet sliding across smooth linoleum. Chatter in some guttural language emanated all around me, washing into my mind on waves of dizziness. Those claw-like hands gripped my arms and neck. Lights passed over my head, illuminating the warped faces of three strange men. I was being dragged somewhere. I heard doors crash opened and slam shut. I felt the sting of winter wind on my face. I saw the glitter of runway lights. I smelled something that invoked memories of my grandpa's horse stables. And then my body collided with a wooden seat. The hands tore off my clothes and wrapped me in something warm and velvety. Someone slapped my face. Jagged fingernails sliced their way down my cheek. Wake up, asshole, a familiar voice called out. You fucking you put in my drink, I mumbled. Nobody goes willingly, the man replied. He leaned over me and tightened a seat belt around my waist. As his face neared mine, I saw a pointed ear jutting from his hair, dead skin curled up from its edges, and a dirty earring dangled from it. Who the fuck are you people? I spat. I could feel my senses returning. My vision blurred once more, and the impact of another hand seared my face. All you gotta do is take the bag to the chimney, someone said over my shoulder. Spirit does the rest. What I said, what spirit, I tried to look behind me, but a fist pummeled the back of my head. The spirit of Christmas, ya fucking chucklehead, I demanded an explanation for all this. The men whispered to each other in that impossible, horrific language. All around me, colorful beacons glowed and blinked in straight lines as far as I could tell. We were on the runway. The man who had spiked my drink sat down next to me, his voice softened. Behind me, his buddies prepped whatever vehicle we sat in, 
Look, the men said, this isn't fun. It never is, not even for us. You've been chosen to do a job, and you're gonna do it. Then you get to go home. No time loss. No one will know you're gone. There's no way you can fuck this up if you just do as you're told. I looked down at the clothes they'd shove over me. It was a stained and ragged Santa costume. Are you out of your fucking mind? I shouted, struggling against my seat belt. The words, what the fuck is that? Tried to escape my mouth, but only sputtered gasps made it through. Those are the ones who refused, the man whispered into my ear. One of the reindeer looked back at me for just a moment. Icicles encrusted his mournful eyes, and a deathly pallor blued and grayed his features. He tried to speak, but his lips had been sewn shut but he meant not Santa. I stammered against the howling wind. My whole body shook. Santa's not really a person, the man replied, draping an arm around my shoulder, as more of a title. That's the magic of Christmas. Buddy, you only have to do this shit once, but we me. Because you understand, he said, your childhood was filled with wonderful Christmases. You've got a good family, and now it's your responsibility to keep the magic alive for a new generation of kids. He'll check in with you. Don't let me down. And, by the way, don't worry about the list. The bag handles all that now. The man retrieved a barbed whip from the floor of the sleigh and cast it out over the reindeer. It sliced up the line of creatures and cracked against the lead one, sending ribbons of blood spraying into the frozen air. Muffled groans of agony wafted from their sealed mouths, and then the man simply leaped off the sleigh and vanished into the night. His friends followed suit. The entire thing looked like a patchwork of human scabs and gore. Just take the bag to the chimney. The man's voice echoed in my head. I lay there for what felt like ten minutes, gathering myself and forcing air into my blistering lungs. The disgusting sack of presents lay just beside me. I was inside someone's house, a stranger's house. He could have a gun. He could shoot me dead where I lay. I could be rested. If anyone catches me, he'll be stuck in a ward with the psychos. Till the end of my days, a million thoughts invaded my mind, but they were soon replaced by the image of the reindeer. I had a job to do and by God I was going to do it. I picked up the sack and stumbled through the house until I saw the glow of a Christmas tree. I approached it, dumped the contents of the sack all over the ground, and headed for the front door. I clambered into the sleigh, tears and snot drenching my face, and shouted for the ugly creatures to fly. They didn't budge, I urged them with a gesture, but they refused to move. They only stared into me. Some of them didn't even have eyes. Black divots yawned from their skulls and dripped blood down their pasty cheeks. I reluctantly grabbed the whip, but before I used it, a Christmas carol played in my head on Dasher, on Dancer, on Prancer and Vixen on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner, and Blitzen. I croaked words into the night and felt the sleigh lurch. Soon, we were in the air again, and moments later, we were on another roof. It took several minutes to find the courage to even move. I lay there in the sleigh, fantasizing that this was all a nightmare, and that I'd wake up soon. But when the reindeer started to become restless and agitated, I retrieved the sack and found it inexplicably full again. I stepped out onto the roof and, to my relief, saw a chimney stack. The ride down washed as painful. Only a few bones broke this time. 
mostly in my skull and jaw. My rival had interrupted a couple having sex beside their tree. I ignored their petrified gazes and dropped the presents where I stood. Merry Christmas, motherfuckers, I grumbled. Then I folded over backwards, groaning at the crunch of my spine, and slithered back up the chimney. The woman's horrified screams followed me. I never stopped trembling atop one roof just before I snuck down another chimney. The man from the bar appeared. How's business, he asked. He grinned, flashing me a row of jagged teeth. Fuck you, I reply, tossing the bag into the chimney. It slid down with a slurping nose. Need anything? You got a gun? The man laughed and approached me. Now don't go trying anything stupid, he said, brushing some of the snow from my coat. You jump off that roof. You'll just get sucked right back up here, same way as the chimney. You try to run away. Well, find you. You think you're the first guy to plot and escape. The man wrapped an arm around me and directed my gaze to the reindeer. Hey, Dasher, he called out. Tell this schmuck how you got your name. One of the reindeer lowered his head in fear. His antlers clattered against the razor wire that imprisoned him. And what happens if I grab one of those kitchen knives down there and slit my own throat, I asked, challenging the man. Your Christmas spirit got a plan for that, too. The twisted jaw on the man's face vanished. No, he replied. In fact, it dies not just for you, but for everyone. He looked out over the town. An ocean of Christmas lights glimmered as far as I could see. All those kids. I shoved the man away and trudged over to the chimney. What do I eat? I called out. Am fucking starving. I've been doing this for hours. The man smiled again. Hope you like cookies and milk. Buddy, am lactose intolerant. I shot back. Well, he said, looking around at the roof, you can eat snow. Fucking prick. I mumbled and dove into the chimney. On and on I marched, across rooftops, and down chimneys, and vents, and pipes. I even slid through the cracks beneath old windows and doors. Once I seeped in through a leak in the attic, I dropped presents and wolfed down cookies. I drank milk and faucet water, and sometimes raided fridges. I shat in strangers' toilets, and told little kids who spotted me to go fuck themselves. All I wanted to do was get back to my girlfriend, my family, my life. But it never ended. After thousands of houses, I lost count. I lost track of time. The world blurred into an endless night of repetitive tasks. I slept between cities, and over oceans I warmed myself by the fires people had left burning, and scorched myself on them as I left. Unspeakable burns, and blisters, and cuts, and bruises crisscrossed my wretched form, but the suit always remained the same, weathered but functional. Tens of thousands of homes passed, countless little towns, Infinite arrays of apartment buildings. I mostly navigated those by sliding around in the septic tanks and crawling out of toilets. I ate and slept and delivered presents. I snarled at anyone who saw me. I aged. My body expanded beneath the weight of all those cookies. My face plumped, my cheeks reddened, my hair grayed and dyed to winter white. I carried the whip inside with me, and sometimes flayed the families I did like the families without proper chimneys. I choked some of them to death. I wanted to see their faces turn as blue as the faces of my reindeer. I hid their bodies beneath their Christmas trees, and stuck little festive boughs in their hair. But the night still wouldn't end, it went on and on for years decades, and the sun never rose. 
Morning light never conquered the horizon. The howls of the wind never die. The snow never stopped falling. I lost track of everything. I lost my count, my path, my memories, my name. Lost it all to the dark. The only thing I could remember anymore was the solitary phrase I uttered on Dasher, on Dancer, on Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, and then on one occasion, as I slid down a chimney, I stumbled upon a little girl sleeping on a couch beside the tree. I hurled the presents to the floor, not caring if I woke her, and turned to leave. As I did, a tiny voice chirped out, Santa, I whirled around, ready to growl a string of curses at her, but saw that she held out a green piece of paper with both hands. I made this for you. I know you work really hard. I cautiously approached and took the paper from her hands. It had a drawing of me and nine happy little stick figure reindeer, one with a glowing red nose. You're all alone on Christmas. The card went blurry as tears welled in my eyes. I tried not to let them fall. After a few seconds, I managed to find my voice. Thank you, sweetheart, I said. That was very nice of you. I'll keep this forever. The little girl threw her arms around my huge gut and hugged me. I ushered her back to the couch and tucked her in. Merry Christmas, I whispered. I made sure Kelly's eyes were closed before I returned up the chimney. I made sure not to scream as my collarbone snapped and my ribcage caved in. The moment I reformed on the roof, a gnarled fist collided with my face. I saw the clouds. I felt the roof's shingles on my back. And then I heard that familiar voice say, Well done, kid. I awoke face down on the bar counter in the airport. People bustled all around me. The glass bottle of root beer sat beside me. My body was young and thin again, and warmth coursed through my veins. The man with the ugly hands approached me from behind the bar. Don't miss your flight, he said, tapping his wrist with a clawed finger. Why, how did I try to speak? The heavy haze of sleep weighed down on me. Everything's fine. He interrupted. Get going. It's like I told you before. He flashed that fang smile at me. There's always time for Christmas. Story 2. Carol's Christmas Cookies. Today was the annual holiday potluck. My office doesn't really do parties. But every occasion gets a potluck. It's business as usual except everyone brings food. We work while stuffing ourselves, silly. Nothing like working through a stomach ache, right? It's always a game of food poisoning roulette. Since I was the first one in, I was expected to do the basic setup dutifully. I cleared off the sorting table and got the coffee going. I expected to spend the first thirty minutes of my shift in peace, but it was to be. The phone started to ring. It's too early for this, I thought. I answered anyway, putting on my best customer service voice. At this hour, most customers hadn't had their coffee yet, so answering the phone was a crap shoot. Fortunately, it was only Carol. Thank God you answered. Can you let me in? My arms are full. She always brought enough baked goods for everyone to have seconds and thirds. It was one of the few things I looked forward to. It'll be right over. Hold on, I hung up and hurried over to the employee entrance. I yanked open the door and found Carol standing there with a heaping stack of Tupperware in her arms. The scent of gingerbread hung around her like a warm Christmas perfume, sweet and inviting. Let me help you with that. You tried to get it all in one trip, huh? I carefully grabbed a few of the containers, making sure not to tip them over and walking with her inside. 
Carol smiled appreciatively, relieved she could finally set everything down. I took a peek at the goodies, as expected, gingerbread cookies, gingerbread office workers, each one bigger than my hand and intricately detailed. What do you think? She asked, puffing out her chest with pride. I made one for everyone in the office. After I pass these out, I'm out of here, though. I'm not working today, but I wanted to make sure everyone got theirs. Wow, I admired her handiwork. It only took me a moment to realize that the gingerbread cookies were model. After our co-workers, I looked eagerly for the one she'd made of me. But I didn't see one. These must have taken you forever to make. The details are perfect. No one can top these. Suddenly my crock pot of meatballs seemed a lot less exciting. Oh well, it was a competition, as if I could beat Carol's Christmas cookies. By then, my phone started to ring so I hurried back to my desk. I watched Carol pass out her cookies with care, placing them on desks atop pretty poinsettia plates. Are you going to be open on Christmas, the customer asked, the second I picked up. No, hello, only a shrill inquiry. No, but we will be open as usual on the 26th, I answered. What do you mean you won't be open on Christmas? What if I need help right away? He'll have to wait. I gave my scripted answer to the angry customer distracted and deadpan. By the time the call was done, Carol came over with a smile, bringing the very last cookie over to me. I do say it's too pretty to eat, except he was never really a looker, was he? She said. I looked down at the gingerbread man. It was me, it was our boss, Dale. This one's mine, I asked tentatively, definitely confused. Maybe there was a mistake, of course. How many opportunities do you get to bite your boss head off? I wanted to give you the honor, if Carol sensed my disappointment. She did let on. I looked down at the cookie again, a dense gingerbread man in a cheap suit. Even though the suit had been made with glaze and frosting, I had that impression, cheap, ill-fitting, and gray. A perfect replica of one of his two suits with a garish Christmas tie. As long as it doesn't taste like Dale, I laughed, to be honest, as perfectly made as the cookie was. I didn't find it appetizing. Well, I did. It smelled amazing, but there was something off-putting about eating a cookie shape like someone else, especially Dale. Then again, it would be just as weird to eat one that looked like me. Cookie cannibalism. You didn't give him one that looks like me, right? I shuddered. Now that would be creepy. Dale was a real piece of work, but I had to tolerate him if I wanted to keep my job. Of course not, Carol assured me. Could you do me a favor? Wait until everyone else gets in before you eat it. I want everyone to see. I wish I could see the looks on their faces. You'll tell me, won't you? Sure. I slid the gingerbread away from me. To be honest, I wasn't sure if I was going to eat it or not. But I didn't want to hurt her feelings. Maybe if I scraped off the decorations first. That seemed equally rude, though. When you eat gingerbread cookies, are you the kind of person to go for the head or the arms and legs first, or maybe you pull off the decorations one by one? She asked, suddenly. Carol was looking at me when she asked. She was looking towards Dale's office. What a weird question, especially coming from her. When she saw the look on my face, Carol laughed and patted my shoulders. Sorry, I was just having a funny thought. There's a little sadist in everyone, is there? Excuse me, grabbing her empty Tupperware. Carol gave me a wink and wished me a Merry Christmas. 
She left, leaving me alone in the office. I kept eyeing the gingerbread, Dale, still feeling a bit weird about it. Weird, but also hungry. The cookies smelled divine, which was out considering I.D. never been a huge fan of gingerbread. About ten minutes later, the rest of my co-workers trickled in. They complained about how tired they were, morning traffic, and the holidays. Of course, the belly aching became exclamations of delight when they discovered the cookies set neatly on their desks. Everyone started showing one another their cookies and taking pictures, marveling at the perfect detail. Patta's cookie had her trademark beehive up dew and pearls. Mark's cookie was bearded with squared glasses. Betty's had electric blue eyeshadow and dimples, though the outfits weren't an exact match. The resemblances were uncanny. Eventually, the clamor died down and everyone sat at their desks, all except Patty, who scurried over to my desk with a wide smile. I don't see yours, she said, showing me hers for the second time. She carried her plate proudly in both hands, like she was presenting a piece of art, to be fair. Carol's work really was exquisite. I just did like Patty. Patty's eyes moved to the plate ID set away from me. My cookie wasped like everyone else's, which suddenly seemed like a problem. Oh, it looks like Dale. Is it yours? She scrunched her face at me, somehow managing to keep the smile. I didn't like her insinuation. Yes, it's mine. Did she really think I'd scarfed down my cookie and stole another one off my boss desk? Really? Why doesn't it look like you? Then, oh yes, the insinuation was still there. A bitter anger spread across my tongue, but I fought to keep my voice level and my face flat. It was weird that I was the only one with a cookie that looked like someone else, but I didn't make them. It washed up to me. Carol thought it would be funny. That's all, Carol, but was she fired yesterday? Patty's expression scrunched up even more. Her hands moved up to her pearls, fidgeting with the long strand. Sometimes I wondered if she wore pearls just so she could clutch them. Ah, uh, no, wouldn't a memo have gone out if she was? I turned my attention back to my work. I hoped Patty would get the hint and go away, but she just stood there for a long moment, sucking in a deep, dramatic breath she picked her plate off my desk, staring hard at the gingerbread patty. Didn't you make these? She asked slowly. No, I brought the meatballs. Why would you think I made them? I answered, not looking up. I pretended to read an email. Patty was being nosy, as usual. I did never like that about her. She didn't have anything better to do, I guess, except for the work she let pile up. But if I said that shit complained to Dale, Patty was his favorite for some reason, so I'd probably get written up for not being a team player. Like a lot of offices around the world, this one was toxic. I'm not sure if this is okay. He'll be right back. Patty said, unaware of my rude thoughts. I looked up when she said that, unable to help myself. She did explain, pivoting towards Dale's office, to tell on me or Carol. I honestly was sure either way. It was a headache for me. She reappeared in the doorway with Dale a moment later. They both made a beeline straight for my desk, their expressions a lot more serious than a cookie called for. Great, I pretended not to notice, busying myself with a stack of fresh paperwork. Before they reached me, there was a loud cracking sound and a scream. Every head in the room whipped in the direction of the sound to find Robert tears running down his face. 
All I could see was his eyes poking up from his workstation, expression twisted and red. My arm, he screamed, oh my God, it won't move. A couple co-workers ran over to see what happened. I reached for my phone instead, ready to call 911 if an ambulance was needed. Patty and Dale change course, but everyone looked confused. How on earth had Robert hurt his arm? I'll sitting at his desk. Carpal tunnel, knows your chance, came an errant thought. My eyes slit towards the gingerbread Dale, it looked perfectly palatable on that pretty poinsettia plate. Hurry, before they confiscate it. Now was the time to worry about cookies, but my tongue tingled with anticipation, and my teeth itched with the urge. Just one small bite, the thought was strange, almost like it was mine, but very compelling. The gingerbread man was heavier than I expected. I lifted it to my lips and bit off one of the feet. It crunched in stereo, unusually loud as the foot snapped off and began to melt on my tongue. Delicious. A rush of delight washed over me, brought on by a flood of flavor that drowned out Dale's cursing screams, head fallen, rocking back and forth on the floor. He must have twisted his ankle in his haste to check on Robert. How unlucky, two injuries in one day. A chorus of oh my gods rang through the office, but I set down my phone so I could hold the gingerbread Dale with both hands. Without even thinking, I took another bite, nibbling up the leg before switching to the other foot. The screaming kept getting louder, filling the room. The gingerbread had such a rich and complex flavor ginger, cinnamon, allspice, cloves, and something else. Was it earthy, or maybe it was the texture, soft and velvety, yet dense and crunchy. Wow, so much screaming. All over carpal tunnel and a sprained ankle, annoy. I glanced round the room to find that almost everyone was screaming. The ones who weren't screaming were chewing with blissed-out looks on their bloody faces or slumped over their desks. Confused, I touched my own wet mouth and looked down at my red fingers. I wasn't in any pain. Had Carol put glass in the batter or something? Where was the blood coming from? Why was everyone still eating? Because they can't help themselves. I couldn't help myself either, without realizing it. I'd eaten half of the Dale cookie, and found myself going in for another bite. Horrified, I dropped the cookie, the gingerbread snapping in half as it hit the floor. Dale, curled up on the carpet, was suddenly still and quiet. Patty was right next to him on the floor, but she didn't seem to notice. Chewing frantically with glazed eyes, gingerbread crumbs, and blood running down her chin. Only when her mouth was empty did she resume screaming again. She rolled and started eating her cookie off the carpet. The spell the cookie cast on me had broken with my boss's spine. He was dead, and with each quieted scream a co-worker joined him in death. I was the last one standing, the last one screaming. Soon, I was standing in perfect silence. No more screams, no more chewing. Only then was I able to move. I grabbed my keys and ran out of the office. Maybe I should have called the police, but I didn't know what I was going to tell them. That Carol's Christmas cookies had killed everyone but me. That I'd chewed my boss to death with a voodoo gingerbread man, I couldn't come up with a logical explanation in my state of pure panic. Even though my voice had broken, my thoughts kept screaming. I ran through the snowy parking lot and found my car, and not sure why I ran. No one was chasing me. There was no one who could, before I could jump into my car and drive away.
I noticed the little red gift bag sitting on the hood of my car across the front, written in glitter, with the words Merry Christmas from Carol. I was terrified, but looked inside the bag anyway, as I feared. There was a cookie. My heart thudded in terror, but I felt compelled to examine it. In spite of my dread, I started to salivate, clenching my teeth together. Even after what I witnessed, I wanted to eat it. The cookie washed me, it was Carol, Carol, down to the outfit shed worn that very morning. Except for the sorry piped across her sweater in her head, I swallowed the bloody spit in my mouth, reaching back into the gift bag. There was a Christmas card inside, still holding the gingerbread Carol. I opened it up. The key was taped inside, along with a simple message. Merry Christmas. There's a gingerbread office in my apartment. If you smash it, everyone will think the roof collapsed. That should explain all the broken bones. Don't worry, no one will find me. P.S. You were always kind to me. That's why I spared you. I hope you'll do me one more kindness and make it quick. Love. Carol. I closed the card, tucking it back in its envelope, and sitting in my car, I looked down at the cookie still in my hand. My tongue tingled, my teeth itched, I didn't want to do it, but I had to. I bit off Carol's gingerbread head. It tasted like gingerbread and death. Story 3 On the first day of Christmas I lost my innocence, my father was a diplomat who shook hands with the most powerful people in the world, a businessman with foreign affairs, managing an empire so vast that the sun never sets upon it. He was an army veteran in Afghanistan and a doctor in Ethiopia. In fact, he was so important that he went everywhere and did everything except for coming home. That is... When I was little, I used to love hearing stories about him. I liked to imagine that I'd get to meet him someday, and the two of us would go everywhere I heard about in Mom's stories. It wasn't until I was eight years old when I realized how strained her voice was. When she talked about him, or how selfish I was for always bringing him up, I didn't ask for any more stories after that and Mom never brought him up on her own. She must have loved him terribly for it to still her after all these years. My mother once said the longer you wait for something you want, the better it is to have, like interest building up in the bank. So every day he didn't come home was a punishment. It would only make their reunion that much happier when it finally did happen. It would have been so much easier if he did come back, though. I wouldn't have to walk home from school because Mom would be there to pick me up, and I wouldn't have to make my own dinner because Mom wouldn't need a second job in the evening. Some nights I'd try to stay up until she got back, but I'd usually fall asleep on the couch watching TV and wouldn't see her until the morning when she woke me in my bed. The older I got, the more mother's stories debt makes sense. Even if only one of them were true, he must have had at least one opportunity to visit by now. Army contracts are only four years, and if he was as rich and important as she said, then he must have been able to send a little money so mom wouldn't have to work so hard. The only explanations I could think of was that he was either dead or lost. If he was dead, I intended to find out where he was buried so Mom wouldn't have to keep waiting. If he was lost, I'd help him find his way home again. A friend suggested that my parents might have gotten divorced and just didn't love each other anymore, but I didn't think that was true. Mom wouldn't still be hurt if she didn't love him, and I didn't think it was possible for anyone not to love my mom. 
So I started my search. I asked my grandparents on my mother's side, but they were tight-lipped and quick to change the subject. I spent my lunches looking for him online on the school computers, but there were hundreds of people with the same name, and I only had a single grainy photo to compare it with. He might have gained weight, or grown a mustache, or even lost an arm in battle for all I knew. The one thing I was sure about was that he never changed his name, because if he was lost, then he'd want to be found again. So I started going down the list of the hundreds of people with the right name and sending each a message asking if they were my dad. Most didn't reply. Some seemed concerned, others creepy. But I didn't let that bother me. I started out with my city, Serenity Falls, but quickly expanded my search to the whole state of Wisconsin. Would moved around quite a bit when I was younger, but would never left the state, so I thought that's where he must be looking for us. Then one day I messaged someone and asked if they were my father, and he replied with my mother's name, and I knew I'd found him. He was older than I expected, and most of his hair was gone, but he still looked a lot like the photograph, a lot like me, and no one using the other school computers could understand why I started to cry. He asked a lot of questions about my mother. He asked for pictures of her and wanted me to tell him everything. I told him what city we lived in, and he promised to drive there right away even though it was over a hundred miles. He didn't seem to mind that Mom would still be at work because he was excited to meet me, too. For the first time in my life, my dad was going to pick me up from school. I couldn't focus or sit still through any of my remaining classes. When the final bell Wang, I exploded out of my chair so fast I knocked my whole desk over, but I didn't stay to pick it up. I was the first out of the building and was waiting on the sidewalk within a minute. He was already waiting for me. My dad had even less hair than his picture, but I didn't mind because he drove a red Ferrari. I asked if he really was an international businessman, and he laughed and said he did that in his spare time. He didn't want to meet Mom at home or at work because that was romantic. Instead, he wanted to take me to the real Serenity Falls the town is named after. That's where they had their first date, and she could meet us there. I texted Mom and let her know a surprise was waiting for her there, and she promised to get off work early. It was only about a twenty-minute drive, but I feel like we really bonded in that time. Dad didn't like talking about himself, and asked me a thousand questions instead. What games did I like to play? How was I doing in my classes? Who were my friends, and a thousand other nothings? His eyes would light up with even the most boring answer, as though it was a miraculous revelation from on higher. I teased him for that, but he got all serious and said, You don't understand. I didn't even know you existed until today. You are just telling me about yourself you're being created from nothing right here in front of my eyes. It really is a bit like a miracle. Serenity Falls was quiet around the Christmas season. We were the only ones in the parking lot, so we got to drive all the way to the head of the trail, which led to the viewpoint. The water was all frozen in snow and ice, and it wouldn't be a waterfall again until the thaw of the spring. It was still beautiful because of the long icicles lancing off the jagged rock. The light seemed trapped within the crystals which shimmered as the light faded. We stood together in silence overlooking the falls for several minutes. I started to shiver, but he put his arm around me and drew me close, and I almost started to cry again without knowing why. When is your mom going to be here? 
he asked at last, not for at least an hour. Do you want to wait in the car where it's warm? He asked. Why did you really leave? I blurted out. He withdrew his arm from around my shoulders, and we stood together in silence again. I lied earlier, he said, still staring at the hang eyes. I counted twenty-six individual icicles before he continued. I did know you existed before today. Then why did you I cut myself short? I wasn't ready. I loved your mother, but I didn't want to have a family yet. I'm sorry. I shrugged as if it had nothing to do with me, but I couldn't look at him. Were you really in the army? I was, and a diplomat, and a doctor, he laughed in response. It was a warm sound, and I wasn't shivering anymore. But you really did love my mom, I asked. I still do, more than anything, he said. That's why I'm here, but I'm still not ready to have a kid. I don't think he'll ever be. It hadn't gotten any colder, but I started shivering again anyway. He put his arm around me again, but it didn't feel as comforting as it had before. His fingers were gripping my shoulder a little too tight. It's only going to be cold for a minute, he said. After that you won't even feel it. It'll just be like drifting off to sleep. I want to go back to the car. I tried to pull away, but he wouldn't let go. Everybody wants something, he said, but not everybody is willing to do what it takes to get it. He slid behind me, and suddenly both his arms were around me. I struggled and kicked, landing a solid one into his thigh before he got me off the ground. He grunted, but did let go as he lifted me over the railing. I braced my feet against it and tried to push back, but he lifted me even higher until I couldn't reach it anymore. He flung me over the ledge to tumble down the twenty-foot drop to the frozen water. I smashed straight through the ice and plunged into the numbing depths. I spun over once or twice trying to orient myself, and by the time I was able to surge upward again I couldn't find the whole ID broken through. All I could feel was the underside of the ice. It was thicker than it seemed when I fell through. My numb fists moved sluggishly through the water, pounding feebly. I went back to searching for the hole instead, but the freezing water stung my eyes so badly I could barely see. I saw the vague outline of his shape through the ice, though. He was standing directly over me, looking down. He watched me flail against the underside. The weight of my wet clothes was beginning to drag me down, and my chest felt like it was about to explode. Each time I surged upward, it became a little harder to reach the ice, until the time I couldn't reach it at all and began drifting down. I watched him turn and begin climbing up the slope, and everything went black. I came to a moment later, when I heard the sports car rev to life and pull away. I lurched upward again, and by blind chance one hand slipped through the hole in the ice. I couldn't feel my fingers as they latched onto the edge. Somehow the air was even colder than the water, but inch by excruciating inch I dragged myself upward until I de-pulled myself from the water. I was barely alive when my mom found me. I didn't want to tell her what happened, but even lies meant to protect someone can do more harm than good. I told her everything, and she promised never to let that man back into our life again. If my future children ever ask me about my father, I'm going to tell them the truth, that he tried to kill me that he was never caught, and that no family is incomplete that has love. Story 4. All I want for Christmas. I've asked the nurses not to play any holiday music in the ICU. They tell me that it's a decision from management, 
and that it's out of their control. But an orderly finally took pity on me and brought me some earplugs. Better than nothing, I suppose. At least they make the trembling stop. I'm still too weak to move from the bed. I'll have to tell my story through talk to text. But first I have to decide where it begins. Did all this start with the anonymous gift, perfectly wrapped in gold paper and red ribbon, the note and candle that it contained? Or was it even earlier, when the holiday shopping season began in the mall gift shop that I used to manage? We sell knick-knacks, specialty cards, and seasonal decorations, jewelry, stuffed animals, and scented candles. I'm sure you know the place I mean. Unsurprisingly, the holiday season is the busiest time of year for us. I needed all hands on deck to decorate the shop on the last weekend in October. It could have meant all our jobs if we couldn't get the store numbers into the black. And if I had to be there, then so did my employees. We were a team, and being part of a team sometimes means you have to give up your Saturday off to come in and hang. Decorations. We all have to make sacrifices. Still, there was a lot of grumbling among the employees setting up fake snow in the store window and preparing the collectible ornament display. I reminded them that I was paying a whole dollar more than minimum wage. Eight dollars and twenty-five cents hour, and that we had at will employment. If they weren't happy in my franchise, they were free to go somewhere else. I hear most of the others pay less, but at least they got things back on track. At least, until transportation costs screw my budget. If you don't believe me, just take a look at shipping costs a year ago compared to now. The only way I was going to make it was if I cut hours and added some nice incentives, like free gift wrapping. I get that being alone in the store is no cakewalk. Look at the long hours that I work. And sure, wrapping package is perfectly is easy, but that's what work is. You show up and to what you're told. Why couldn't my employees see that? That was when some of them started to call in sick, maliciously, I think, and against my clear instructions. Since we were short-staffed, no one could be out for any reason. I mean, I don't offer any health insurance, so there's no way that they were actually going to see a doctor, as if the unexpected illness weren't enough people actually started to quit. Goat riddance. There were always more where those came from, and it was a good chance to cut away dead weight. I mean, if they weren't even loyal enough to come in when I called, if they couldn't be cheerful for the customers, or wrapping gifts, if they couldn't deal with a little cold or some overtime, then they deserve to be jobless. As far as I was concerned, the silliest thing at the time was the reason some of them gave for quitting. It was what I expected. It was even something I thought about. My employees just didn't want the store to play holiday music anymore. Impossible, I told them. Those songs were what got the customers in the mindset to buy, and, besides, I gave them three different CDs to rotate each day. I was being unreasonable. At least one of them gave me a parting gift, even if it was anonymous. At first, it seemed much nicer than the inappropriate words I found carved in the staff bathroom. The gift was in a small box wrapped in golden paper and tied with a red ribbon. The wrapping was immaculate. I'd written up enough people for shoddy wrapping to know the difference. And the gift inside was a candle from our very own store. I didn't recognize the smell or the label, but it came with a tiny card. All I want for Christmas, it read, is you. That was 
nice, I thought, a little weird, but nice. It was about time someone showed a little gratitude to the guy who signed their paycheck. The ex-wife had the kids for the weekend, so I lit the candle, set it on the coffee table in front of me, heated up some dinner in the microwave, and settled into my recliner for a James Bond marathon. Make my wish come true. All I want for Christmas, I recognized store CD music before I even began to wonder about where I was or how I got there. The last thing I remember was the intro to Dr. No. I must dozed off. It was hard to breathe. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move my arms or my legs. I.D. Ben, wrapped, mummified in gift paper. I just want you for my own, more than you could ever know. My ears were splitting. I hated loud music. I winced at every high note. I had to make that awful sound stop, but how I couldn't see. Even squirming like a worm was a huge effort. It made me sweat, then panic that I wasn't getting enough air. Long before I became a successful franchise manager, I'd been a Boy Scout. We went caving once, and one of the chunkier boys got stuck in a tight squeeze. We had all sniggered at his predicament. Helpless, wriggling, buttons flying off, even wetting himself in his panic. He should have just skipped a couple Twinkies, I remember thinking. But that was then. It was a lot less funny, and it was me who was unable to move with empty lungs and a full bladder. The paper was wrapped so tight that I could taste it on my tongue. If I forced my neck up and down, I could weaken the stuff a little, but the effort for even such a tiny movement was exhausting. Holding on to me so tight, what more can I do? I don't know how long I kept at it. Soon the CD track started skipping, making me cringe even more. I passed out several times from the effort and the lack of air, just to wake up shivering in my own piss, sweat, and drool. The room was freezing. It must have been hours before I could crinkle the paper enough to breathe properly. Then days before I was able to free my arms and legs by twisting them against the wrapping until they bled. When I pulled the gift wrap from my head, it was still totally dark, except for the blinking light of a CD player taunting me. As soon as I could move, I smashed it. Overhead, blinding lights came on, and then the music started. I don't want a lot for Christmas. This is all I'm asking for. It came from everywhere. There were probably speakers hidden in the walls. I thought my ears would bleed. I wished they would bleed because that might muffle the sound at least a little bit. I held on to my ears and took in my surroundings. It was a kind of holiday hellscape. The fake snow on the floor came up to my knees in places, and there were enough plastic trees to fill a shipping container. Cardboard boxes were stacked up to the bare concrete ceiling. I don't care about the presents. Underneath the Christmas tree, in front of the forest of plastic, was a small package, wrapped in gold paper, tied with a red ribbon, just like the candle. My fingers shook as I tore into it, deck the halls, read the anonymous Christmas card inside. Beneath it was a piece of cake, the kind I got for the employees' birthday parties because it was always on sale. It had gone stale days ago, but I hadn't eaten in at least that long. My stomach rumbled, and the tiny dessert did nothing to sate my hunger. There's no point in going into the details of all my attempts to escape from that nightmare of a room. It's enough to say that they all failed. The music and a uh, sea blasted out from all sides. I was so, so cold, but I couldn't even hear my teeth chattering over the festive songs. 
In the end, I had to improvise clothes from this old wrapping paper and insulate it with fake snow. I found Santa suits in one of the boxes. Even when I put them on over my ridiculous wrapping paper suit, I still shivered. It took me a long, long time to realize there was only one way to get more cake. Deck the halls. It's not easy to decorate Christmas trees with shaking fingers. It's even harder on every time an ornament falls or is placed properly. A buzzer sounds, then the music volume goes up and the room gets a little colder. That's how I figured out that someone was watching me work, a kind of sadistic Santa watching over their trembly elf. Oh, I won't ask for much this Christmas. I won't even wish for snow. Sure enough, when I finished a tree, a slot opened in the wall. I ran for it, yelling as loud as my horse throat would permit. A chunk of stale cake flew through the slot, along with a cold cup of coffee that splattered across the floor. It was slammed shut before I could try to force my frigid fingers through. I collapsed on the cold concrete. I cried. Two days, two days of that hellish music. Two days of icy work to make the tree absolutely perfect. And this was all I got. One piece of cake and some spilled coffee that I had to lick from the concrete like a dog. It was sickening but I needed liquids. There was a whole room full of trees to go. I'm just gonna keep on waiting underneath the mistletoe. It was tinsel, ornaments, endless strings of lights, stars, angels, pentacones, candy canes, and collectibles. Each time the decorations weren't spaced just so or I wasn't working fast enough, I got it. The buzzer the increased volume, the blast of cold air. If I really screwed up, the pathetic chunk of cake got even smaller. I just want to see my baby standing right outside my door. By the end of the first week, I had finished about half the trees, and my health and hearing were permanently damaged. Night or day, the music never stopped. The blazing white lights ahead never went out. The cold nose and light made it almost impossible to sleep until I collapsed from sheer exhaustion. If I slept too long, I'd get the usual punishment. I had no way of knowing, but too long seemed to be any longer than several minutes. Then it was back to work. I was getting nutrients. Each day I became weaker and weaker. It must have taken more than ten days to finish the second set of trees to my taskmaster's satisfaction. By the time I placed the final star atop the final perfect tree, I could see my breath and clouds around it. My fingers around it looked blue. I wobbled back, waiting for something, anything, to happen. But the CD just played on like not even the end of the world would stop it. I lost it. I don't remember the next part too well. But when I came to I was laying in a pile of destruction. Plastic pine needles and smashed ornaments were everywhere. And based on what was around my neck, I tried to hang myself with Christmas lights. I won't even stay awake too. Hear those magic reindeer click. It was like whoever had put me here had forgotten about me. The cake and coffee was disgusting, sure, but it had been keeping me alive. The buzzer dent sound, the slot dent open. There was only one explanation. I had finally been left to die. What more can I do? All I want for Christmas, baby, is you. It was several days later when the police kicked in the door to rescue me. Apparently, the disgruntled ex-employee who kidnapped me had been stopped for a routine traffic violation on his way to the abandoned basement where I was being held. He had a list of priors and, when he realized the cops weren't going to let him go for a long time, he confessed where I was. He hadn't wanted to kill me, he said. 
He just wanted me to see what it was like. I guess you could call that my own little Christmas miracle. The nurses tell me that when they dragged me out of there, I was near hypothermia and barely conscious. I wouldn't have lasted a day more, and yet, they tell me I was singing a long story five. Why I don't celebrate Christmas anymore? I don't celebrate Christmas anymore. Nobody in my family does, but they used to. When I was a little kid, up to when I was ten, he celebrated it every year and, traditionally, the whole family celebrated it at my parents' house. I don't know what my dad did, exactly, but I know he worked for the government and whatever he did, it must have paid well. The house was practically a mansion. There were three floors and a swimming pool in the garden. Normally most of the rooms were empty, unless I'd invited some friends over to play hide-and-seek in them. But from December 23rd to New Year's Day, every room was occupied. In fact, once we'd given everyone a room, though some of the kids did end up sharing, there were only four rooms left, not counting the bathrooms. The kitchen was usually full of cokes, and nobody without a job was allowed in there on pain of being killed and served up with dinner. The dining room was too small to do anything but eat in and round Christmas. My parents seemed to use it just to store their most delicate, breakable and expensive decorations, and the lounge was full of mums. Dads, aunts, uncles, and grandparents all chatting and drinking wine while the news played in the background. So, for us kids that only left my playroom, the room where I kept my games, it was pretty cool actually. Me and my friends often spent time there, but when you've got a group of kids in the same room, the entertainment has to be suitable for the youngest kid there. My Aunt Lily had kids late, so her eldest was five. This meant all my mum let us watch was this old Thomas the Tank Engine video that she'd saved from when I was little. It was the really ancient one, the one narrated by Ringo Starr, and the theme tune alone was enough to make me want to rip my own ears off. I tried to escape as much as possible, but my friends' families had their own things going on and wouldn't always let me hang around. The only other option was my older cousins, but they were no use whatsoever. Apart from my Aunt Lily, all my parents' siblings had had kids before them, so when I was ten, most of my cousins were in their early to mid-teens. This meant that the girls all sat in one corner and talked about makeup and boys, and the boys all sat in another corner and talked about football and girls. Any attempt by me to break into either conversations was met by cries off your too young, go and play, which, considering what I remember overhearing from those conversations, probably weren't totally unjustify, so I was left to sit on my own and play with my Legos or read a book and get bored out of my skull. Either way, I may have been an only child, but I had a large group of friends who all lived within walking distance of my house. I wasn't used to sitting alone and quietly getting on with some solitary activity. That last Christmas, I decided I'd finally had enough, and so I left the playroom and went to sit in the lounge with the grown-ups. Don't ask me why I thought I'd be happier sitting silently, listening to conversations I didn't quite understand in there, instead of doing it in the playroom, where there were toes. But I guess I was just in one of those moods you get in when you're a kid. The grown-ups didn't seem to mind me being in there at first, but after a few minutes of me interrupting every conversation with who's that, or what does that mean, or, most commonly, what was the joke, 
I don't get it. Their patience wore thin. When my great uncle started telling a story about a nurse he'd met in the war, she always gave me extra sugar in my tea, he said, and a little extra something else. When she was doing the night shift and everybody else was asleep, my dad suggested that I might want to go back to the playroom. I, for whatever reason, decided to take this as an insult and said fine. If you don't want me in here, and ever the drama queen, I swept out dramatically my flailing hand, knocking a glass of red wine over onto my grandma's pale blue dress. I was sent to my room, lying on my bed, gazing forlornly through the window at the Christmas decorations on our neighbor's house. Christmas lights covered the walls and roof and to reindeer frolic happily in the garden, though something had gone wrong with the lights. So one of them didn't seem to have a head, and decided that I hated Christmas. Spending time with my relatives was boring. I couldn't spend much time with my friends. The food was awful as a kid. I always hated Brussels sprouts and mashed potatoes and things like that I still hate turkey, though I've since discovered the joys of mashed potatoes and gravy. It just didn't seem worth the presence. Now, nah, to make things worse, I had been set to my room on Christmas Eve, Christmas Eve. Before we'd even had tea, I turned my gaze away from the window and looked around for something to do. Most of my games were in the playroom. I tried reading one of my books, but ended up just throwing it at the wall in frustration. It made a rather loud bang and I wondered anxiously whether the nose would be enough to send my mom or dad running up the stairs to my room. I'd already been set up here. I didn't want to put my Christmas presents at risk. After a few minutes of worry, it became clear that nobody was coming. Perhaps they don't care. A voice in my head suggested, perhaps they can't be bothered to come up. The book had made a very loud noise when it hit the wall. They don't know it was a book. The voice continued. It could have been anything. What if it hadn't been the book? What if it had been that shelf falling on you and hitting you in the head? You could be lying on the ground right now, bleeding to death, and all your parents would care about was what happened to Great Uncle Tom in the war. I clenched my fists and looked around for something to punch. Instead, my eyes fell on my notebook. Lying on my desk, I tore a page out, found a small, stubby pencil lying under my bed, and began to write, Dear Santa, I put down, pushing down so hard with the pencil that I think I tore the paper in places. After a few moments, though, I dropped the pencil and looked at my handiwork. As letters went, it wasn't that great. The edge of the page was ragged from where I'd torn it out of the book, and my ten-year-old's handwriting style left something to be desired. Still, I could read it, and I was sure Santa could, too. The only problem now was where to put it. There were different traditions in my family as to what you were supposed to do with your Christmas list. Some including me threw their letters into the fireplace so that they would fly to the North Pole as smoke. Some posted them, and most of the older teenagers just handed them straight to their parents. None of these options, though, was possible for me. I could hardly hand this letter to my parents, and there was no fireplace, let alone a post box, in my bedroom. In the end, I just shoved it in a box with one of my old board games that I no longer played with, intending to put it in the fire later. I remember thinking serves them right. Of course, I wasn't left up there for all of Christmas Eve, in truth. I don't think I was up there for more than about half an hour. Pretty soon I was called down by my mum who said that tea was ready. I had to have some sprouts, 
and mashed potatoes on my plate, that it was only a little. I also had loads of Yorkshire pudding and pigs and blankets, which I love. Afterwards, the whole family sat in the lounge together to watch home. Alone, I forgot all about the letter. This next bit is kind of hard to write. The next morning, like every Christmas we celebrated in that house, I ran into my parents' bedroom and bounced on the bed until they got up and started making breakfast. Only this time they didn't wake up. I bounced for about ten minutes, though really I knew something was wrong the moment I stood up on the bed. Now I was getting bigger. They were usually quicker to tell me to get off. It was only when my mom actually rolled off the bed and landed face down on the floorboards, without crying out, that I realized there was something wrong. When I switched the lights on, I saw that she and my dad were dead, very dead. Their skin was a pale grayish color, and judging by my mom's position, as she lay on the floor like a drop doll, rigor mortis had already set in. By the time I noticed the dark rings of bruises around their necks, my throat was already hoarse from the screaming, and I was being dragged out of the room while one of my uncles called 999. Needless to say, the Christmas celebrations were canceled that year. After the ambulance had left, I just sat in my room staring at those reindeer next door and wondering if I was ever going to wake up from this nightmare. The funeral was on New Year's Day, and afterwards I moved in with my Aunt Lily and Uncle Kevin. They lived in the area, so I didn't have to move schools, but I couldn't see as much of my friends as I had before. It didn't bother me much. I was still lost in a fog of grief. Eventually, of course, I made it out of that dark cloud. I stopped bursting into tears every time something reminded me of my mum and dad, and I learned to laugh and feel happy again. I caught up with my old friends and made new friends at the local secondary school I passed my exams, got a nice job, and was lucky enough to marry the girl of my dreams and have a beautiful daughter. I'm happy. Still, since that day, I've never celebrated Christmas, and out of respect for me, I think, my aunt and uncle never made a big thing of it. They gave my cousins a few gifts and put up a tree, but they didn't force any of it on me. For years I actually had a phobia of Christmas. It got so bad that my teachers had to start finding reasons to send me out of the room while everyone else was making Christmas decorations after I threw up in class one time. Even after I got over my phobia, the sight of anything with Santa on it was enough to give me a panic attack. It took ages for my therapist to figure out why. It seems obvious to me. My parents had been murdered on Christmas Eve. Santa always comes on Christmas Eve. In my mind, that meant that Santa Claus had been the one to kill my parents pretty messed up. Right? They never caught the guy who killed them. I think they gave it up a few years ago, declared it a cold case. I've been assured, however, that it couldn't have been Santa Claus because Santa doesn't exist. He definitely doesn't exist. Since my darling Sabrina was born, my wife Melanie has started celebrating Christmas with her. I don't join in. Of course, they both go and stay over at Melanie's grandparents' house while I stay at home. But it's nice that my ruined childhood doesn't have to mess up Sabrina's. Earlier today, Melanie mentioned that she and her family always use to love board games, especially snakes and ladders, and that they'd been planning to play it while she and Sabrina were staying over there. Problem was, she said, nobody had a board. She was telling it as a joke. She just found it funny 
that, after so many years of playing the game, nobody actually had their own board, but for some reason it kept hanging around at the back of my mind. I only realized why a few hours later, after Melanie had gone to work and taken Sabrina to playgroup I work from home, and I suddenly remembered that I had a snakes and ladders board or, at least, my aunt and uncle did. When I'd moved around to their place I had, of course, taken all my games and toys with me but most of them had ended up in the attic. There was nobody to play with them. By the time I'd actually started living again, I was too old for board games. That meant that it was almost certainly still in the attic. I rang my aunt and uncle up and asked if I could go over to their Zan, rummage around in the attic for a bit. When I told them it was a Christmas surprise for Melanie, and Sabrina, they quickly agreed. Aunt Lily adores Sabrina. It was fairly easy to find. My uncle likes to keep everything organized, and the attic is no exception. Forget the stereotypical dark room full of cobwebs and old, overflowing boxes Uncle Kevin spent one whole summer the year I was thirteen, fitting the attic with new lights and alphabetizing everything. Every box was stacked and labeled, and luckily for me, Alan's stuff was near the top. I only had to dig through to boxes before I found it. When I did find it, I was a bit disappointed. I'd remembered it as looking like it had when I'd last played with it, and hadn't accounted for the years it had spent first under my bed and then cram into an old cardboard box. The box for the game itself was faded now. You could only make out the faint outline of one of the snake heads, and it smelled funny, like it had gone moldy. I lifted the lid gingerly, half expecting to find mushrooms growing or a family of spiders inside I wish I had. Instead, I found a scrap of paper with a ragged edge from where I'd ripped it out of the notebook. Like I said, I'd forgotten all about the letter, but the moment I saw it, everything came flooding back. What I'd done, what I'd written, what venom I'd put behind those words. My childish handwriting was nearly illegible, but I didn't need or want to read those words again. I know that Santa can't have killed my parents. I know he doesn't exist, but I can't help wondering if he read my letter. Dear Santa, I wish that I never had to sell Celebrate Celebrate Christmas again.